I'm very much just looking forward to listening to Emma. All yours now, Emma. Over to you. The topic is why is it so easy to hack humans? And you may think, well, you're an insurance broker. Or if you don't know, I'm a commercial insurance broker. What's that got to do with insurance? And with insurance, we always look at, at risk and providing solutions to, to mitigate and solutions so that there's cover there if things do go wrong. With COVID, there's been a big backlash with clients saying, well, you never even discussed pandemic insurance with me. Why not? Fortunately, the British Insurance Brokers Association has concluded that brokers aren't negligent in not discussing pandemic insurance. It was totally unprecedented and that there wasn't the insurance providers out there to be providing pandemic cover for SMEs. However, cyber is very much an area that I'm sure James will agree that us as brokers, we need to understand cyber risks and we need to be able to provide our clients with information about risk so that they can evaluate then whether they want to insure against it. You've obviously got your legally required insurances, your employer's liability and your motor insurance that you need. But any other insurance, it's a case of balancing out, well, what are the premiums and what's the risk and, and do I actually need it? So I've done a lot of work on cyber insurance and it's frustrating the take up is really, really low. Initially, it was always referred to as cyber liability. And the misconception that the risk is if we transmit a virus out to someone else. But it's not really about cyber liability. Cyber insurance is more about first party cover. It's about what you do if you put your computer on and it says malware attack or ransom demand. Pay this Bitcoinage or else we've encrypted your data. We've encrypted your backups and potentially with GDPR, they could breach it out there. They could get you in all sorts of trouble in terms of being able to function your business and GDPR breaches. So what we want to do is really understand those risks. And the first point of, of sort of looking at risk is with cyber, people say, I outsource my IT. The company that I outsource to assure me they've got firewalls, they've got every bit of protection you can have. We don't have a risk. We don't have to worry about that. However, over 90% of cyber attacks are as a result of human error. And the cyber policies provide cover for these first party losses, cover for companies to investigate what on earth happened, get their data reinstated and reduce the impact on their business and reputationally deal with any issues so that their customers and their suppliers want to carry on trading with them going forward. So why is it so easy to hack humans? And the very fact is because we are human and we're impulsive. We know the logic of certain things, but our actions don't necessarily dictate that as to what path and route we take. And a really good example of this is, is Bobby, who you've seen. Now, the first puppy we were supposed to get, um, we were let down by a breeder. Um, they told us when the puppy was born, we've got everything planned. We didn't pay a deposit, but she decided to keep the puppy. This was at a time when Steve's mom had passed, our family were all really excited. And then all of a sudden we're not getting this puppy that we knew when it was born, we were celebrating everything. So we went on the internet <laughs> to find a replacement puppy. And I spoke to this lady, well, there's a few other stories, but we've not got all day. I spoke to a lady and she sounded lovely. The dog was advertised in Warsaw. And she was actually in Weatherby, but her sister lived in Warsaw. So that's why she sort of put it on the, the local ads there as well. She explained that she'd bought this dog for two and a half thousand pounds. Kennel Cub registered as puppy, slinky. Um, but she just couldn't cope. And it wasn't fair on him to keep this puppy because he needed the love and attention. She'd got extra hours at work. She was only asking two thousand pounds for him. Sorry, just bear with me. <laughs> Well, we may not like me speaking about another dog. Um, yeah. and, and basically, she had me hook, line and sinker. I was on the phone to her. I was explaining um, how much we were looking forward to getting a dog. She then recounted a story of a friend of hers that sold a dog and didn't want to sell it to just anyone, was very selective, sold it to someone for less because they promised a good home. And then it appeared on a website to be sold, sold on. And so she really did have me hook, line and sinker. 
And so she said, well, yeah, if you can put a deposit to secure and then you can arrange to come and pick him up, which we agreed he's out. Um, and it, it was in Weatherby. So I was like, oh, this is, this is a three hour journey. So the deposit part was kind of like, well, whatever. Um, but the journey of three hours really sort of, sort of made me think, I've got to make sure this is absolutely right. So I sent her a form that I got off a puppy website to verify various details. And she gave me some information about, and it slipped out as not kennel club registered. The parents are kennel club, not the puppy. A few more things transpired. And she wanted to arrange to meet at a service station because her mom had got fibrosis. And with COVID, it was all very concerning. Don't go to a house, meet at a service station where there'll be CCTV, so it's all fine. So we agreed that. And I was like, well, okay, this is who I am. Sort of, well, I'll be driving this car, uh, and this is who we are. Can you confirm your vehicle reg number? And she provided the bank details straight away. They came over and just confirmed the, the address the bank account's registered to. So she, 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 and this is, I was talking on the phone as well as what's a WhatsApp message. And um, she confirmed the half of a reg number. And I was like, okay, can you, can you just confirm the whole of the reg number? I don't know it. Okay, um, do you want to just take a photo of your car when you get to it and, and send me that? Took a photo and it came through with half the reg number on the photo. And I was just like, oh, I said, what? Well, okay. I said, oh, photo doesn't seem to have come through correctly, half the reg number. So I said, if you, if you send me a utility bill, you know, just, I just want to verify your address before we do the bank transfer. Um, and then I got a message saying, I don't want to sell Slinky to you anymore. And it was like, oh my goodness. Um, it was a real shock because I was talking to her, I was talking to her for probably about an hour in total over a number of calls. And I was hook, line and sinker, convinced that she was genuine. So I then did a bit of research and apparently 280,000 pounds Action fraud have been notified of of people paying deposits for puppies and kittens during COVID, and people have really latched on to COVID to be sending out some horrible, horrible phishing emails and texts asking people to donate money to help underprivileged people, to help the NHS, to help buy PPE. And so many of these are just scams, and I don't know whether. We live in a protected bubble where we surround ourselves with mainly nice people. And the internet is just a wide open place. If we were to go out in a rough area in Birmingham or any other city, we would be alert and we'd be careful. If we go out in the rain, we put protection on. But on the internet, and our, you know, we're, we're very much in a sort of false sense of security. If we're, we're checking our emails and we're in the comfort of our own office or home or wherever. And we're just not programmed to be that savvy. And it's, it's very much catching us unawares. In hindsight, and when you reflect, and before we were nearly about to pay the deposit before I did all the extra verification checks. And I just said to my husband, if this is dodgy, I need to tell the police that we've sent money to somebody we've never met, know nothing about, based on a photo and a video of the most gorgeous little dog scamping around. This is going to make me look absolutely stupid. But if your heart runs away with something, it's very hard to rein it back in. And so the cyber criminals out there, they know that the companies have really robust security in place with firewalls and all sorts. So I'm just checking my timer. And so they know that it's far easier to go for a human. And so if you get an email through saying you've got a tax rebate due, and with all the changes with, with COVID and all the grants and all the various things, anybody getting legitimate information isn't really going to be able to, de to determine well, what's legitimate, what's not. And it's the, the fact that if you click through, or sometimes even if you don't click through, the fact that the emails come into your system can plant malware in there. And you, needn't, you don't necessarily know straight away. So the malware could be in there for usually, I think, about 100 days. And it's watching, it's watching keystrokes, it's, it's collating all this information. There's some email, phishing emails that can come in. And if you click on the link, your password hash, which I've never even heard of, effectively, it, it just drags out all this information that can then be used for, for fraudulent reasons. So what can we do about it? Obviously, we can get insurance, but 
insurance is kind of the last resort. Ideally, we get risk management procedures in place to prevent this happening. So there's a bit, there's a sheet I can send round, and it's very much sort of the tips of, of what to look at on the, the social engineering. So the social engineering red flags. If you receive an email, is it to you or have you just been copied in? Is it from someone you're expecting it from? If it's to a group of people, are you familiar with those other people that it's been sent to? Now, worryingly, you can spoof domains. So, and at the moment, I, t- I ran a test yesterday on this, and there's a, a company that Beasley are cyber insurers. They work with a company called No Before, who are one of the world's biggest cyber training providers, and they will run a spoof test. So my email address is er at insuranceday.co.uk. So they ran a spoof test on that, and they sent me an email from myself. And that's terrifying because I think most of us know if you get an email, you right click on what the email address purports to be and then see underlying, is it from that actual domain? So a year ago, I got our IT people to specifically set our domain so it couldn't be spoofed. I didn't even think of asking them to check that that was still the case. So even if we get an email from someone that we're absolutely certain it is from them, it may not be. In terms of the content misspellings anything unusual unusual links it's, it's this sort of am I expecting to receive this email is it and it's gut feeling if you get an email and you think it's just that's just a bit weird chances are your initial gut reaction and gut feeling is right hyperlinks so that you may have a hyperlink where it's asking you to click through and I know our emails go around saying policyholder resource so click through to the hyperlink this is where you get your information But what you want to do is right click and and actually look, select the properties and see if the actual domain that it's linking through to is the one it's is the one it's purporting to be. Because a lot of the times it's masked. And then by the time you click through, you're in all sorts of trouble. Um, Hyperlink misspellings. And now with Zoom, I got an email from Zoom the other day talking about uh, my recording, my Zoom recordings ready. Well, there had been a meeting that I had recorded. And, and so it, it did, didn't strike me as being odd. And then I thought, hold on, that doesn't fit in time-wise. And so I right-clicked on the Zoom email and it came up as Zoom on the, the sort of the, the name of it. The underlying, it had got Zoom in there, but with a whole load of other rubbish. So that was a virus and would have been an issue. So the date, the time that people send emails, now this is a tricky one because it says if, if the email comes through at three in the morning, you know, be a bit suspect. But Unfortunately, you know, people do work at all sorts of hours. I know myself, if I work out of hours, I just save my emails and then send them at a respectable time. But people do. But that, that could be something to be looking out for. Attachments. The only safe attachment to open is a text file. Now, nobody sends anything in text files. Some attachments will be looking like they're a PDF document, but could actually be an image. And Image attachments tend to be viruses, and it's just another way that they use it to, to, to try and trick you. So the content, we don't usually get emails that we need to act on immediately, immediately straight away. I get a lot of emails saying you're, um, you've, you've got emails in your spam that you need to check. Your email account is full. Unless you go in and, and do some housekeeping on it, your email will be deleted. And in the office, I get a lot of the team emailing and say, is this legitimate? Is this legitimate? And in the, it's just not because our mail server is separate. If there's an issue with the mail server, I know who I'll be contacted by. But with all the homeworking, it is just so easy for someone to think, oh, God, oh, I can't have my emails, did it? Or I need to do this. And this is what they're playing on. It's the hacking of humans. It's, it's using and acting on our weaknesses to, to make us do things and often we'll do things and then the minute we the second we've done it we think I shouldn't have done that but too late on email so if you this is Peter's email that he sent yesterday I went into the email and you can look at properties and this is the properties of the header so just the header there's all sorts of investigation you can do on this to find out where the original email came from what the domain is, you can then check the domain, check the IP, see when the domain was registered. If it's a domain that's been recently registered, it's in Russia, there's all sorts of flags that if you actually do some additional analysis, you can flag up. 
but unfortunately most people have already clicked through by that time. So just wanted to close on, on Jeff um, Bezos of Amazon. Now, I don't know whether everyone remembered this, but in 2018, his iPhone was hacked and um, yes. photos and images, whatever, went out. So that was as a result of a WhatsApp message from the Saudi um, Prince Mohammed. And he got the IT forensics to investigate all of that. And they're not even sure he clicked on it. The fact that the WhatsApp message came to his phone was sufficient. And I know with apps, a lot of us download apps and there's lots of things that you have to accept going through. And you could be saying, yes, access to my contact, access to this. And if we allow apps access to everything, then there's the ability for malicious apps to just take over our phones totally. So really, it's gaining an understanding of our risks. And no matter how good our security, IT security providers are, whilst we still employ humans, whilst we are still human, the risk to companies of cyber attacks is significant.